My name is Richard Harding. I'd like to thank you for accepting my invitation to learn about this new exciting uh, therapy of radio frequency ablation of thyroid nodules. Um, I'm going to take you to a PowerPoint presentation, uh, but first let me introduce myself. For those who don't know me, I'm a general surgeon practicing in Phoenix, Arizona for the last 25 years, and I've been uh, teaching general surgery and endocrine surgery to residents, uh, both in the University of Arizona program and also the Creighton University program. And so we're going to talk about the new treatment, the new exciting treatment of thyroid nodule ablation, which should change uh, the future of thyroid surgery considerably over time. First, let's just talk about thyroid nodules. Uh, thyroid nodules, as we all know, very, very common. They're palpable in four to seven percent of patients. They're discovered incidentally on CAT scan or MRI uh, between 16 to 18 percent of the time uh, and in patients who are asymptomatic. Uh, is present in 67% of population as seen by ultrasound, and 50% of patients over 60 will have a thyroid nodule. So, as we know, most of these are benign. Most are asymptomatic. Cancer is not rare, however, so patients who have thyroid nodules will certainly want to know if these are uh, benign or cancer. Uh, and again, uh, aggressive cancers, however, are extremely uncommon. And it's certainly our, our, our ambition is to prove uh, with biopsies and surveillance that these are not these aggressive cancers, so we catch them early. Until now, the only therapy for benign thyroid nodules has essentially been surgery. And so at this point, we're going to try to uh, uh, t uh, tell you about other options that are available which avoid surgery altogether. So, uh, I first take you to some literature, and recent literature, and this is an article out of Italy, uh, published in 19, uh, pardon me, 2015, in which they studied a thousand, approximately a thousand patients. They followed them over five years, and they, they basically followed all these patients' nodules uh, to measure them sequentially over the five-year period, and they had biopsied these and pr proven them to be benign, but then they followed them over time and they showed that the uh, nodules grew approximately 10%, 10 to 11% would grow over time. Uh, surprisingly, 13% of them actually shrank in time, and then 76%, which is the majority, remained unchanged in size. So, uh, so that's an important study to know, because patients are gonna frequently ask you, is it gonna get bigger, is it gonna get smaller? And what they found is that the patients who are younger tended to grow, uh, more often and at a faster rate, whereas the patients who are over 65, the nodules tended not to change at all. So the next study uh, that's relevant is this study uh, by Dr. Uh, Grogan and Peter Angelos, which is a meta-analysis studying specifically the, uh, the frequency in which the patients who have large thyroid nodules uh, would have false negative uh, biopsy rates. In other words, when, these, when the nodules were biopsied and the biopsies were read as benign, and then the patient subsequently had surgery, how many of these patients were found later to in fact have cancer? Uh, and what they found is that the false negative rate for nodules three centimeters, four centimeters, and five centimeters, and they broke them up into segments, that, they, that the false negative rate was very low, and they studied uh, 7,000 patients in this meta-analysis. So, uh, that's quite a powerful study, and that led them to conclude that for patients who have these large nodules, if the no large nodules are in fact asymptomatic, they would no longer re require surgery or recommend surgery based on the potential of a false negative biopsy. So that's very important because that allows us to move ahead with leaving tissue in and simply ablating it uh, with radio frequency. So uh, now the radio frequency is essentially an alternating current at a very high frequency. And the frequency in the ionic molecules, which are the proteins and cells, of course, uh, will create heat when they vibrate. And this heat now, this frictional heat within and around the catheter uh, is, is then conducted through the tissue of, of wherever you're applying it. In this case will be the tumor. Uh, now the heat over time will cause irreversible cell damage. And we want that heat to cause this damage without the carbonation of the, of the tissue because when you get carbonation of the tissue, it acts as an insulator and then the heat does not continue to disperse as well as it sticks on the needle. Now there's special probes that are designed that have a treatment area of five to 10 millimeters 
that allow for a very precise application of, of this heat when, when, when the energy is activated to the areas that's, that are targeted. And the way it works is there's an internal cooling system through this very fine needle probe that allows us to cool the tip of it and cooling it allows it to heat up slowly but not to the point where it, it spikes and you get carbonization of the tissue. So, uh, so the, the heat uh, transmits slowly and, and just gradually and, uh, and heats up just enough to kill it without, without burning it. So the medical applications currently using this technology uh, are uh, neurosurgery and using it on nerves, uh, greater, you know, the, the following the cervical nerves, lumbar nerves, facet joint nerves. Uh, we're using it for ablation, endovascular ablation of saphenous veins, specifically varicose veins, but they can be saphenous veins or perforators and it's very effective. Uh, it's very effective today using it on patients with atrial fibrillation uh, for rhythm control. Uh, patients with multifocal or unresectable uh, lung cancer can be treated uh, and for, uh, for palliation uh, to effectively destroy this uh, tumor tissue within the lung without requiring an operation. So that's very effective in, in many patients. And then the same with liver disease and the same, uh, well, Barrett's esophagus is now being treated with this in some centers. It's a very superficial treatment that's very effective. Adrenal gland metastasis can be treated as well as hyperfunctioning adrenal glands, which uh, themselves, the hyperfunctioning or the increase in hormone level makes the patient a very poor candidate for surgery. And so you can destroy the gland, at least destroy the function of the gland enough to get the patient's hormones uh, under control and make them a better uh, candidate for surgery later. Again, you can take out uh, solitary tumors of the kidney without uh, losing your kidney function, which is, uh, of course, a, a primary goal. But what about thyroid nodules? So until now, thyroid nodules, specifically the symptomatic ones, have only been treated with surgery. So uh, in Korea, this has been, uh, been performed since 2002, and that's spread through China and Europe. So what about this? This is the perfect nodule. You got a nodule itself. It's big. It's palpable. Uh, it's, it has a nice rim of thyroid tissue below it, right in this area. It has uh, the nerves way down here. You got the carotid way over here, and this is really targetable lesion here. So that's our that's our optimal patient right there. So um, as I said, these have been performed since 2002 in Korea, which is where this was pioneered by an interventional radiologist named Dr. Uh, Jun Beck. Uh, and then he's taught thousands of people in, in Asia, as well as in Italy and in Austria. And now this is even being performed in Brazil. And these are the international guidelines that have been published. Uh, and I show you these because they've been published quite a long time ago and even revised. And so this is a technique that has been utilized for years. It just only recently got FDA clearance in the United States. But it's also being performed in Brazil. And uh, it's very, very popular method to uh, abate, ablate these symptoms and to correct these symptoms in these large nodules. So who are the candidates? Who are the, who are the patients we want to treat? So uh, first of all, patients who have symptomatic nodules from compression, of course, hoarseness, soreness, uh, just they feel that lump, they feel it when they swallow, the food gets stuck. It's very common. And most of these are going to be over two centimeters. And of course, the patients who are also candidates are, are the patients who have nodules, who are, which are two centimeters, and have been shown to uh, continue to grow. Uh, so the patients who have thyroid cyst or thyroid cyst components uh, should first uh, receive ethanol ablation. Is that been, that's been proven to be uh, quite a bit more uh, effective and cost-effective as well. So the next group is the patients who have cosmetically visible nodules. Again, the ones that are, you see the lump when they swallow and then one's just sticking out, particularly in the front. And the patient, they just don't want to see them anymore. And then in, the, in that case, you need two biopsies. In all cases, you usually want about two biopsies to confirm that it's benign. And then in a hyperfunctioning nodule, if you got someone who's got subclinical hyperthyroidism and just doesn't feel well, uh, or is responding poorly to medications, or simply just doesn't want to take any medications, this treatment can ablate your hyperfunctioning autonomous nodule in one treatment. And it's been shown to be quite effective 
in doing this and restoring youth thyroid condition. And in that situation, you want one nodule. So the different techniques, you have the fixed ablation technique in which you uh, put in the catheter, it goes in the tissue and spreads out in the tissue. And that's very effective for lung tissue and uh, in liver in particular, uh, maybe even in the adrenal gland where you can just aim for the middle of the adrenal gland and just kind of ablate just the middle of it. But it's not particularly helpful in the thyroid because uh, those prongs get very close to the, to the nerve. They're hard to control. It's hard to really ablate the entire thyroid gland that way. And so as a result, and plus you want to preserve the residual thyroid tissue without destroying it. So, uh, so the new technique is called a moving shot technique, and it's a lot more precise in just treating the thyroid tissue that you want to treat and leaving the, the uh, peripheral tissue intact. And uh, what the, the tissue is treated from superficial, from the, from you go in the superficially, go through the thyroid, and then you treat the deepest part of the nodule, and then you, then you ablate it from deepest to superficial, and you avoid any injury to the tracheoesophageal groove uh, in, in all cases. So, and this is the concept, basically, this is the trans isthmus approach using the moving shot technique in which you, you start down here, you put obviously through the skin all the way into this space and you have to target it very specifically. And then you turn and you activate your, your catheter here and withdraw the probe sequentially. And you can apply more energy as you get away from the nerve. And then you go a little, then you go further laterally and then you place it further laterally and you treat, you treat it two dimensionally here. And then you move up from, from caudal to cephalad to treat the whole nodule. And obviously, so this is, these are the triangles that we try to avoid applying energy to, which is right, right in this particular area, right where the nerve would be. And obviously we want to avoid applying any energy to the carotid artery. And there's ways to do that with tumescent anesthesia or, or tumescent uh, fluid to put fluid around these areas to create a sink of, of, of energy or sink uh, where the cold water protects the tissue. Uh, the advantages of RFA, obviously there's no scar. It's minimally invasive, so it's practically non-invasive. Uh, there's no hospital admission. Uh, the very quick recovery, the patients go to work the next day. Uh, there's, uh, it's all done under local anesthesia. The patients are actually speaking to you during the operation. It's an easy procedure. The patients just show up. Uh, we, we have them lay down in a dark room. Uh, we give them the, the sedation. We don't, we, they can take a pill if they like to. Uh, they don't have to. Uh, and then we, uh, then we give them the local anesthesia, we do the procedure, and then we observe them for a couple hours, and then they go home. So uh, they don't usually drive themselves. We usually have them come with someone. But they can come back the next day. Uh, the results are fantastic, actually. They're better than good. And in fact, if you only get a good result and you see some residual tissue there, you can always go back and retreat it. And it's just as easy the second time to retreat. The best thing is that there's no hypothyroidism afterwards. You preserve the pre-existing thyroid function. Uh, most of the patients that you're gonna recommend this to are gonna be euthyroid patients and uh, who, who intend to stay euthyroid and wanna avoid medications. And the thyroid and, and the complications of, of, of this is tremendously lower than, than surgery. Uh, there's no instance of hypoparathyroidism. There's no, the, the voice issues are minimal. Uh, compared to surgery, which of course you get uh, voice changes from just having the endotracheal tube in, any manipulation of the larynx, regardless of the nerve. If the nerve is functioning fine, you can still get voice changes even when the nerve is perfect. And so you'll see these for a couple weeks, even to a couple months after, sur after surgery, but in this case, you avoid it altogether. So the complications, and these are complications that are reported in multiple meta-analysis, and these are the rates. Uh, the voice changes, 1%, very, very low. Hematoma, 1%, extremely low. Vomiting, that's usually related to the anesthesia. Skin burn is related when the catheter gets a little bit too close to the skin. Uh, brachial plexus injury is reported, but this is in patients who have got metastatic lymph nodes that are being treated, and these are cases really who are being treated for um, can thyroid cancer in which the recurrences are present and symptomatic and that's really not the population that we're talking about. Uh, the tumor rupture is when the thyroid nodule is very large and you treat it up to the capsule just on the edge of the, of the thyroid and you treat it to the edge and then over time after the procedure this tissue expands 
it'll rupture that the surface of the thyroid into the soft tissue. But most of this is truly necrotic tissue, and so it just gets absorbed and it goes away. So it doesn't require any surgery, but it does cause some swelling. Uh, the abscess with this is a, could be a problem, and that needs to be treated aggressively with antibiotics. Usually tumor rupture is actually treated with steroids and not uh, any and, and simple observation or, 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 anti, or non steroidal anti-inflammatory. But the best part is that in these multi-analysis or meta-analysis is, is that the incidence of hypothyroid is less than 0.1%. I mean, it's incredible. So these patients truly preserve their thyroid function, which is the true benefit of the procedure. As we know, the, 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 the incidence of hypothyroidism for a lobectomy is somewhere between 60 to 75%. So the main weakness is a rate of frequency ablation is that you just don't have the tissue to send to the pathology. So of course, that's why we wanna biopsy it several times in advance, just to make sure that there's no concern. Also, there's also, there's also the possibility that, that we don't apply enough energy and the nodule is not completely ablated. And so what happens is you get tissue growth around the periphery of the nodule, and then that tissue growth will then, um, uh, will then look funny on ultrasound when we do surveillance later, because there's surveillance, when I say surveillance problems, there's just surveillance uh, of the residual thyroid mass, and we'll measure it and we'll watch it, and we look for any signs of tissue growth on the edges using Doppler ultrasound, that sort of thing. And so the patients will come back several times later for surveillance, and this surveillance is really to measure how much the nodule shrinks. Uh, the, the, the contraindications for this will be pregnancy, anyone with a serious heart problem. Clearly, we're not going to do those patients in the office. You can do them in the hospital, but not in the office. Uh, contralateral vocal cord palsy we can, it could then make them a potential uh, uh, bilateral vocal cord injury, which would be a real problem. Uh, and then the substernal nodules are a problem because it's difficult to actually use your ultrasound to, sonic, to use your uh, uh, get your, uh, your ultrasound waves deep to the clavicle and then actually see that tissue deep to the clavicle enough that where we can actually target the, the deep tissue of, the, of, of that deep nodule. So it's really not an ideal uh, case for this technique. Now, anyone who has follicular neoplasm uh, is not a candidate because those patients need to have that tissue sent to pathology and analyzed for the potential of follicular adenocarcinoma. Uh, we're not doing cancers right now, but uh, there is some multi-institutional studies being uh, organized where they're going to be doing subcentimere thyroid nodules. We'll talk about that later. And uh, the, the a gray area would be autonomous, uh, or pardon me, um, uh, is atypia of undetermined significance. In those particular uh, patients, uh, the, uh, both the thyroseq and the affirma test, when they are benign, uh, both claim a 4% false negative which is the same as what we just talked about in that previous study. So in some cases, you could probably do an autonomous, uh, uh, probably an atypical nodule uh, of undetermined significance if, uh, if it's small, uh, but it has to be explained that it is a gray area for this, for this technique. Uh, before the procedure, uh, these are the things that we like to look at in the patients. We like to check their symptom score. Obviously, if someone has a symptom score of zero to one, you're not gonna do it, but if, between one to 10, they're gonna come in, they're gonna say it's a seven or an eight or a nine. Uh, cosmetic score will tell you how to grade that. Uh, the, uh, these are the laboratory tests we like to see. Uh, some people like to check thyroid globulin levels and, uh, and also an anti-TPO antibody tests. And I think that's important if we're gonna be looking at these patients for research in the future, uh, but that's not really necessary for deciding to do this case. Uh, but in general, it's not a bad it's not a bad idea to have that a test of that on hand uh, because we don't know if those patients will develop those antibodies after the procedure. So, um, uh, but basically, we want basic thyroid functions. We want them to be euthyroid head. Pathologically, we want again benign diagnosis and at least two ultrasound guided biopsies, either FNAs or core needle biopsies. Core needle biopsies are much better than FNA, but it's hard to find a core needle on the market that's a small core needle. Uh, the, uh, uh, in, a, in a patient who has an autonomous functioning nodule, you want a, a study, which is an I-131, a study to confirm that it's autonomous functioning, and then one biopsy should be sufficient. Or if the thyroid looks classically benign based on ultrasound, 
uh, you know, such as fun to form knowledge, fun to form characteristics, uh, then you can, and it's fairly highly specific benign features, you can, you can treat this after one biopsy. So then we do an ultrasound and we want to do the ultrasound to both measure the thyroid nodule and also to note where this nodule is in relationship to the surrounding critical structures that we really want to preserve, such as the nerve, such as the carotid, such as the clavicle. So we want to measure the nodule volume as mentioned because we're going to measure it later. So this is more of our symptom. Now our symptom score is gonna be graded zero to 10, uh, or you can use a visual analog if you'd like to, uh, depending on the number of patients with language barriers. The cosmetic score is graded one to four by the doctor, one being no palpable mass, two being a cosmetic, no cosmetic problem, but it's palpable. Uh, three being cosmetic problem with swallowing. You see that lump going up and down, but usually when they're not swallowing, you don't see it. And then four would be a readily detected cosmetic problem where you see the deformity. So this is me performing an RFA in Brazil. In Brazil, you can actually go and train in Brazil and you can actually uh, you, you know, do the procedure on patients, which is fantastic, uh, which is only available in Brazil, not in, not in Korea uh, or, or, in, or in Italy. So in Italy and Korea, you get to watch. So uh, after the RFA procedure, uh, this is our typical follow-up. We see them the day afterwards to, uh, I, I, I measure them every time I see them. I do Doppler every time I see them and just, just generally to see how they're doing. And they're all coming back doing exceptionally well with really no complaints. They'll say they take an Advil or a Tylenol and that's about it. And then in a month, we'll measure their, their thyroid nodule again and then record their symptom score again, symptom score and cosmetic score. And then we'll do it again in three months and in six months and then again in 12 months. So we measure the volume of the thyroid nodule, which is actually, in my, is actually plugged into my ultrasound. So I'm fortunate to have that calculation already uh, in, in the system. So, and of course, uh, the good thing is that the patients who have shrinkage of their thyroid report that uh, obviously that their, that their thyroid symptoms improve dramatically with the degree of the tumor shrinkage. And it's reported as volume ratio reduction ratio. So VRR is volume reduction ratio. So in the multi-center studies, which is uni uniformly reported all over the world, in one month, they're all seeing about 40% volume reduction ratio, which is tremendous. At three months, they're seeing 61%, and at seven months, it's between 76 and 80%, which is fantastic for the patients. Okay, this is in my office. I'm doing this in my office. I have my, my right hand is on the probe, which is the ultrasound probe. My left hand is the FNA pro, the RFA probe, and you see a blue, two, blue uh, cord, which is, this blue cord is actually the energy cord, and the, the white tube is actually uh, the, the cooled uh, saline solution getting pumped through this probe here. And then this is me looking at where this probe is, and here we see the trachea, and here we see the thyroid, and this is the thyroid nodule, and, and this is me just applying the energy right here, and you can just see it's changing right as, right as we save this image. And then the next image, you can see I've, I've applied more, more energy, sorry about that, let's go back, and you can see that I've, I'm now up here treating, and I've already treated this lower area, and now I'm treating this higher area up in here. And the patient's just you know, awake and talking to me and stuff, and, and, and I usually have a mask on, but in this case, the mask fell off. So this is that same patient, a 47-year-old a gentleman with an autonomous functioning nodule. And before the RFA, his nodule measured on transverse imaging 3.38 by 4.56. And then 30 days later, you can see that it's a centimeter smaller in all dimension. So, so it's 2.36 by 3.44 centimeters, which is tremendously smaller. And then here, again, on, these are longitudinal images. It was 5.16 centimeters, and, and it shrank to 4.1 centimeters on longitudinal. So the, the volume went from 41 MLs all the way down to 17. And this is more than a 50% reduction in my, in my first treatment. And I will admit that this patient had a cystic component to this, and the cystic component was treated first with aspiration, and then we did the RFA. Uh, but the cystic component did not return uh, uh, after this study. So that, that's very favorable as well. And he was fine. The patient went to work the next day. 
So uh, in, in summary, the pay, this is a very exciting uh, procedure. It's, it's well uh, received by patients. The patients really want it. Uh, the unfortunate thing is right now it's not covered by Medicare uh, or insurance. And so it's all cash right now. And, uh, but hopefully we'll get approval from the insurance companies and get a code for it. But these are the future applications in which we uh, will think about what about using it on sub-centimeter thyroid nodules. Now we know that uh, there are certain nodules which are candidates for uh, surveillance. And in fact, in Sloan Kettering, Manhattan, they are, they, are, they are observing so many cancers that are in the thyroid that are small and are not as close to the border of the thyroid or close to the trachea or not close to the nerve. And they're just watching these. And what they're seeing is that there's a very low failure rate. Now, the failure rate on these patients is only about 4% in which they actually see the nodules growing over time. And so that's fantastic, except that 8% of the patients really want, uh, really want it out. They, they just don't want to keep getting checking it over and over again. They'd rather just do something. And so they like to have their surgery. So when you see the 13% operation rate, uh, a good uh, you know, eight, eight, seven to eight percent of these patients are patients that are just done with surveillance. They just want to make sure. They're just not, they just lose their comfort uh, with, with the surveillance. And so therefore, these patients. Uh, the, the, this is another potential application, but this is going to be done in a multi-center study. Uh, and then there are already people are doing these on parathyroid on patients with hyperparathyroidism. And in this ca case, you have to have a, a, a parathyroid gland that's really well targeted. It has to be pretty far away from the, the, the tracheal esophageal groove and specifically away from the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Uh, it has to be very easily targeted and, and, uh, and have a rim around the thyroid. And you can actually, in this situation, uh, inject uh, saline or, or, or water, cooled water around the parathyroid gland to separate it from the surrounding structure, put your probe right in the middle of it and treat it and target it. Now, these patients are, a, are at risk for hyper, uh, recurrent uh, hyperparathyroidism, which would be parathyroidomatosis. And so again, this is a uh, area that should be studied and it's not widely accepted. However, it is a potential for certain patients. So uh, this is a very exciting uh, technique. We envision that it's gonna change the treatment of benign thyroid nodules tremendously uh, over time. And, uh, and after it gets accepted, it's gonna be done on an outpatient procedure and the you know, it's gonna require the endocrinologist's help is going to be, uh, you know, the people who are going to do it are going to be the endocrinologists, are going to be the, the endocrine surgeons who are very familiar with ultrasound. All the patients that are treated should be evaluated by the doctor that's very familiar with ultrasound treatment and also is very facile with ultrasound interventional treatment. And uh, so that's going to be a small set subset of the population of physicians in, in, in the country. Uh, but it'll include interventional radiologists, it'll include interventional endocrinologists, and also endocrine surgeons. So well, we welcome this technique and think it'll really change uh, the management of certain thyroid illnesses and make things a lot easier for many people. Uh, thank you very much. And this is, uh, this is the meeting that, uh, that I attended in Italy, which is the uh, first international meeting on, on minimally invasive therapies for uh, thyroid was uh, organized by Dr. Robert Valcalvi, uh, who is an endocrinologist uh, who's been pushing the edge on interventional, uh, uh, interventional thyroid nodule treatment for years, doing both laser and radiofrequency. And he's moved away from laser and into radiofrequency. But at this meeting, they go over things such as uh, high-frequency ultrasound. They go over microwave therapy, uh, laser ethanol ablation as well as uh, radio frequency. So the majority of people are using radio frequency because it's easy and it's safe. Uh, the other treatments are harder to get, get at, uh, harder to obtain the, uh, the, the, uh, the equipment, uh, and are not as uh, universally applicable as radio frequency. But uh, this is a meeting which they uh, intend to have in another year, in 2021, in another city. This happened to be in uh, Northern Italy, just close to Milan. So a very exciting meeting. So, uh, thank you for your attention, and I welcome any questions.